The legendary Rox Pirates have returned to One Piece? We open Chapter 1072 on a wide shot of Egghead Island, and an excerpt from one of Dr. Vegapunk's journals. It's a pretty old one dating back to his time with Mads, the mysterious group he worked with prior to joining the world government. The great scientist is clearly excited about what appears to be his first ever clone. Even though the world doesn't accept her just yet, he's all on board. As far as Vegapunk is concerned, this experiment has been a clear success. Given the old punk's perfectionist nature, this is quite impressive. Vegapunk wouldn't accept a replica of Mythical Zoan as a success due to minor cosmetic issues. This girl must have been truly human as far as Punk Stella was concerned. And for some reason, the old scientist was convinced this was a huge step towards world peace. He even refers to Mads as a laboratory of peace. The caption in Chapter 1069's cover called it that, but also noted that it was funded by Lone Shark King, New Field. That made it sound like more of an excuse for a tax write-off than something legitimate and noble. With this chapter's cover page, we see Vegapunk's fellow scientists making weapons. Was the chief scientist being delusional, or did something happen to Mads that eventually corrupted it? Whatever the case, we'll see more of this journal in just a bit. But in the present, after Bonnie failed to kill Vegapunk with her attacks from last time, she has decided on a new approach. Emotional Blackmail She has used her devil fruit to revert herself to a young child and is writhing around on the floor, howling in pain. Vegapunk knows how Bonnie's powers work. There's no way this should actually be able to fool him. But logic is one thing, a grandfather's instincts are quite another. Peeking out from around the corner and seeing his pursuer as a wounded child, Vegapunk's heart melts. The old man emerges to try and help her. He calls out for his medical staff, worried for his guest's well-being. Bonnie's eyes glinted at that. Her trick worked. Before Punk Stella can react, the little pirate princess gets to her feet. Her body begins to bulge as Vegapunk steps back, realizing what just happened. Before he can get away, a gargantuan jewelry Bonnie lunges at him with a metal pipe. Her muscles look downright ludicrously inflated in this state. Such a powerful transformation is a new move for the supernova, but it fits with the parameters of her devil fruit. It seems Bonnie can age up into a hyper-muscled form, hence her calling this transformation Distorted Future. The muscle of Bonnie isn't stopping there. Her second strike takes out a massive chunk of the wall, with Vegapunk only just able to duck out of the way. The old man breaks into an impressive sprint, calling out behind him that this is pointless. Killing him won't do anything. It won't actually help her feel better. But Bonnie isn't giving up yet. She lunges forward with a pipe, striking the old scientist in the back with her timely thrust. That one strike was enough to end this. With a small pop, a shower of brightly colored gemstones falls out of Vegapunk's torso. Do you realize how big of a revelation this is? Bonnie's power does not require her to touch a target with her hands. In a few seconds, the world's greatest scientist has been reduced to an adorable baby. No more long legs to run with and tiny lungs that can't keep up with an adult. The chase is over. Bonnie shifts back to her regular appearance as the baby punk puffs for breath. Vegapunk wails in frustration, thrashing his arms on the floor, oversized sleeves trailing behind. He's still capable of speech and has most of his intellect intact, thanks to his connection to punk records. He can recognize that the jewels Bonnie knocked out of him are a manifestation of the years she has taken away from his body. Vegapunk scrambles across the floor, trying to reach the gems, but it is hopeless. Bonnie pulls the tyke up by his collar. She points out to Vegapunk that her power doesn't affect living things indefinitely. He'll revert back to normal soon enough. However, for now, he's at the mercy of a very angry pirate princess. Bonnie demands that Vegapunk explain what happened. He killed her father, and she wants to know why. This is honestly much more restraint than we've come to expect from Bonnie. She's finally got a solid confirmation from Vegapunk that he can't restore her father, and that he's truly dead. Despite this, she's still giving him a chance to explain and justify what he did. That's a pretty grounded, mature response, as is Vegapunk's. Even like this, completely helpless, the master scientist doesn't budge. He doesn't plead for his life or try to tell her some sort of encouraging lie. Vegapunk's clearly terrified of Bonnie, but as far as he's concerned, telling her why her father agreed to the pacifista program would only hurt her. While the two of them are having this conversation, we see Bartholomew Kuma's body the PX-0. The citizens of Redport watch as he tries to climb up the red line. It's a fearsome task. The sheer surface of the Great Wall doesn't offer easy handholds. Already, Kuma is panting for breath. There's a downright somber look on the former warlord's face as he clambers upward. 
It feels like there's still some shred of emotion in the pacifist body. Something dedicated to finishing this job despite the pain. Back on Egghead, Vegapunk adds a qualifier. He's not just being protective of Bonnie. He promised Kuma that he'd keep this information secret from her specifically. No matter what, he won't budge on the oath he made to such a dear friend. Bonnie can't bring herself to believe that. She hoists Vegapunk up in the air, pinning the super genius brat against the wall. Her hold firm, Bonnie yells at the little punk to stop messing around with her. This has to be a trick. He's got to be lying. But Vegapunk doesn't budge an inch. He insists he's telling the truth. No one forced Kuma's fate on him. This death was his own decision. Bonnie screams that this has to be a lie. Her beloved father would never choose death. He'd never willingly abandon her. There are tears in her eyes, but her voice is almost a scream as she threatens to kill the world's greatest scientist. How dare he even say something like that? Vegapunk makes it clear that he's no happier about how things played out. He admired Kuma, considered him a close, personal friend. And as the two argue, the Marines are trying to take Kuma off the red line, firing every heavy gun they have at the rebel pacifista. Thus far, nothing has worked. Kumas are a tough bunch, as demonstrated by Kuma Bonnie, who throws a small child to the ground with great force. The pirate princess demands that Vegapunk actually explain, insisting that she won't accept any more half-baked excuses. The little Stella reels at the pain, but before he can say anything, Bonnie turns at the sound of the alarm. Vegapunk takes a second to realize what just triggered. Once he does, however, he tries desperately to distract his guest's attention. He insists that Bonnie not go look at whatever is making that noise. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Bartholomew Kuma. Yeah, the heavily locked up door with the giant paw print symbol on it. Nothing to do with Kuma, no sir. Vegapunk, despite having a gigantic super brain dedicated to recalling all information, felt the need to print a symbol on the door to remind him that this is the Kuma room. Even Bonnie dismisses it as an obvious lie. She goes to enter, but the door is secured by a technological lock. A pretty hefty and complicated looking technical device. What you'd expect of Vegapunk. It's not enough to restrain Bonnie, however. One touch and it ages into nothingness thanks to her devil fruit powers. The doors slowly creak open even as Baby Punk calls to Bonnie. Stepping into the room, Bartholomew Kuma's daughter sees a giant paw ball of energy. The pirate princess simply stares up at it, while the baby Vegapunk pants for breath, trying to catch up with her. Bonnie has no idea how to process this. Finally, having crawled his way over to the doorway, Vegapunk looks into the room. His mind turns back to the last time he was here. The old punk was explaining his theories about memory to Kuma. According to Vegapunk, a scientist from the West Blue discovered that a human body loses 21 grams of mass upon death. As such, that could be the weight of their soul. I guess that means a mysterious island called Massachusetts is somewhere in the West Blue. Because this is a real science experiment that Oda is referencing here. Conducted by Duncan McDougall back in 1907. Vegapunk isn't entirely sold on that, but finds the line of thought fascinating. It's especially intriguing to him in the context of Kuma and his powers. Kuma can control intangible concepts, pulling them from his mind and transmitting them to the people around him. Vegapunk's hypothesis is that they can take that further. What else can Kuma manipulate with his ability? Imagination? Memories? Are these things tangible? Do they have mass? Kuma doesn't seem happy about this. He knows what Vegapunk wants. He's looking for the big guy to pull out his own memories and show them to Vegapunk. Kuma finds that far too personal. The old punk isn't above begging, however insisting that it's for the good of science. He even promises that no one else will ever see them, a promise Vegapunk may no longer be able to keep. Back in the present, he calls out to Kuma's daughter. The baby punk claims that this energy ball is nothing but pain. Unfortunately, Bonnie knows better than to listen to Vegapunk now. She's familiar with her father's abilities, and she can tell this isn't pain, it's his memories. In this ball is everything Vegapunk's been trying so hard to hide. Back at the red line, the marines are getting desperate, fixated on stopping Kuma's progress. They can't let him reach Mary Joa. Finally, they land a direct hit, knocking him off the great rock face. But such a fall isn't close to enough to stop Bartholomew Kuma. The marines draw close, ready to finish him off. But Kuma starts to charge his Niku Niku powers. He's not going down without a fight. As Bonnie reaches for her father's memories, the PX-Zero resumes its climb towards Mary Joa. 
Back in the outer layers of the Labo Stratum, the Straw Hats are still reeling from everything that has happened. Nami can barely believe Rob Lucci made it all the way up here. Vegapunk Shaka claims that the system simply malfunctioned. If he's suspecting sabotage, the Punk of Wisdom is keeping that idea to himself for now. Surprisingly, Usopp isn't worried about Cypherpole racing up the Cloud Lair. He's just happy Zoro and Brook are still on the Sunny, ready to defend it. Even if it's 3 versus 2, he's confident his crewmates can handle Cypherpole. It's strange to see Usopp not frightened by a threat, and a bit touching that he's developed so much faith in his crewmates. Unfortunately, as Shaka points out, the situation isn't quite as simple as a sniper thought. Because backing up CP0 are all four Seraphim. Zoro and Brook are actually fighting seven opponents. Three of the world government's most deadly assassins, and four young pacifista who are qualified as weapons of mass destruction. The odds are ridiculous, even for fighters like Brook and Zoro. However, there's a glimmer of hope here. As Shaka points out, CP0 wouldn't have ordered the Seraphim to do this. The little guys have some self-awareness. Shaka dismisses it as limited, but they aren't locked into strictly following orders like the regular pacifista. They came up to help Cypherpol as the authority figures who most recently had control over them. However, that's actually a problem for Cypherpol. Stussy and Lucci look back at the four Lunarian kids, concerned. They can't order them down to the factory lair now. The dome's back up. This is a serious miscalculation. If any of the Vegapunks get outside, they can take control of the Seraphim away from CP0. The agents would not only be outnumbered, but would also be facing the Navy's strongest weapons. There's no way Lucci's crew could hope to compete with that. Edison and Lilith race off to do just that. The Vegapunk of Evil ecstatic to finally get a chance at joining the fight. So long as Zoro and Brook can hold the line until the two punks get there, the group should have a shot at turning things around against CP0. Sanji stays right where he is, dryly commenting on Mosshead's impending death. So sad that he would finally go down when the crew is this close to the One Piece. But if Zoro dies, he'll finally be number 3 again. Nami has to yell at him that hey, the Straw Hats are in danger right now too. Maybe he should go do something about that. A few words from the Navigator are more than enough to send the good cook into action, even if he grumbles a bit about having to save Zoro. Frankie growls at him to stay focused. This is a potentially vital fight. Everyone's in danger right now. Back at the Sunny, Zoro and Brook take in their new opposition. Brook is more than a little surprised to be fighting a giant animal, and an odd looking one at that. In his defense, he probably thought they were finally done with the weird animal themed opponents after Wano. Zoro confirms that yes, the guy they're fighting is supposed to be a giraffe, though Kaku's new form is different. Still, the demon swordsman isn't worried about a little thing like a devil fruit awakening. He's convinced that his foe is going to end up a diced up corpse no matter what. Kaku is confident. It's impressive to have that much self belief when going up against Zoro. He's more than ready for this rematch, charging forward while daring the samurai to cut him. Zoro readies his third blade, bracing for this attack while telling Brook to look after the ship. Yeah, Zoro just left six out of seven targets to the skeleton. He'll be fighting an awakened Kaku. Brook can fight Rob Lucci, Stussy, S Hawk, S Shark, S Bear, and S Snake, right? Guess he really wants to get back to that nap. That said, his focus may be warranted. The big giraffe isn't playing around either. Kaku lands a quick hit on Zoro, the sheer force knocking the samurai back even through the block. The Zoan user follows it up with a rapid fire spin, going for hit after hit. It's continuing to push Zoro back, but now his guard is holding better. Grunting, the samurai knows that he's had enough of this kind of fighting back in Wano. After all that time spent dueling with King, he's not in the mood for a redux. He's tired of it. And rather than let Kaku start a second long running battle, he's going to end it quickly. Zoro bats Kaku's big head away with a hefty swing, one that draws the giraffe far away from the sunny. But before he can capitalize on this, Rob Lucci intervenes. The assassin has been thinking quickly. He knows the Vegapunks are likely on their way to retrieve the Seraphim. They've only got one chance to turn this around. So he orders the four youths to destroy the entire Labo Stratum. If they collapse a whole complex, they'll kill all the Vegapunks before they can take back the Seraphim, and take the Straw Hats with them. It's a win-win for the world government. Shaka, Usopp, and Nami are not happy to hear this order go through. It seems like the whole area is going to be wiped away. The two Straw Hats scream as the Seraphim begin to charge up their energy blasts. Soon enough, the Quartet of Angels unleashed a full barrage of attacks, rocking the entire lab to its foundations. The outer sections of the Labo Stratum begin to fall away as the clouds above Egghead are raked in dust. It looks like nothing's going to be left standing once the Seraphim are through. 
Usopp and Nami dive for the ground, looking for cover. On the outside, Kaku just watches. The giraffe is back upright again and impressed by his subordinate's power. As far as Square Nose is concerned, the Seraphim are doing their entire job for them. But before he can truly appreciate it, someone lunges at Kaku's elongated neck, biting down on it hard. Kaku turns, trying to see what just happened, but he's too late. Hattori coos in alarm as the awakened giraffe man falls to the ground, unconscious. Luchi turns to look across at the scene. A woman is standing over the stricken giraffe. For the first time, the inevitable Rob Luchi actually looks a little frightened as he asks what she's doing. And we see that this mysterious attacker is not part of Egghead's forces. This is Stussy, now sporting black wings and a trickle of blood still dripping from her lips. The Cypherpol agent has betrayed them. Stussy calmly claims that she just put Kaku to sleep. What's more, she asks Luchi to join him, claiming that it's time for the Cheetah Man to take a quick catnap. And thanks to the narrative captions, we get a bit more information out of her. The CP0 agent is not the original Stussy. Not only that, she's a clone of Miss Buckingham Stussy, a member of the infamous Rocks Pirates. Given Vegapunk's past interest in Kaido, it seems he knows a great deal about Jebek's infamous crew. Even before he joined the world government, he was using their lineage factor in his work as a part of the rogue science cartel, Mads. Why clone a member of the crew though? Was Stussy the mysterious woman who worked as part of Mads? And was she the only Rocks Pirate Vegapunk clone? As always, I'm Slice of Otaku. Thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.